today is Sunday, um, May 14th, and it is Mother's Day. And um, if you're a mother and you're watching, we just want to say thank you so much for everything that you do. And uh, today's a very special day to reflect on um, the, the women, the, the moms, the mothers in our lives that the Lord has brought into our lives that He has used to shape us and to mold us. And uh, whether your mom is still here on this planet or she is at home with the Lord, we will always remember the things that our mothers have taught us and have shown us. And um, we will always be grateful for that. And uh, we just thank you so much this morning. We honor you this morning. And the Lord, um, may the Lord bless you and guide you and continue to encourage you as you uh, continue to be that woman that he desires you to be for your husband, for your kids, for the people around you. And um, we're just so grateful. Uh, so this morning, uh, Pastor Angel, our senior pastor, is actually out of town. So I will be teaching for him this, this morning. Um, we will be in Revelation chapter 2. The last time I was up here, we were actually, actually with a Palm Sunday teaching, so we were not in the book of Revelation the last time I was up here, but we've been going through the letters um, to the seven churches there in, in Asia Minor, and um, we've gone through two letters so far. In this morning, what we're going to look at is the third letter, which is to the church in Pergamum, or Pergamos, depending on how you want to pronounce, pronounce that. Um, and this morning, uh, we're going to learn about a church, a compromising church. And I think there's some really good information, some good things that we can take away from this particular study. So this morning, once again, we will be in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And um, I titled the message this morning, A Compromising, um, a compromising Church. So before we get into the study, let me go ahead and pray once more. And then uh, we'll look at the study or we'll look at the Word of God together this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time once again, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful time of worship we had this morning. We thank you for the moms that you brought this morning. We thank you so much for everything that they do for their families, for their husbands, for their kids. We just thank you for our moms in general this morning once again, Lord God. And um, we pray that you bless them and continue to encourage them. And... Um, we pray this morning for our study time. We pray that you fill this place, fill us, Lord, with the power and the person of your Holy Spirit. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would help me to decrease. That way you can increase, Lord God. And whatever it is you desire me to say, that you would just use me for your glory and to minister to everyone that's here and everyone that's listening via the live stream this morning. We pray for them as well as they hear your word um, come forth this morning. We pray that you once again have your way. We pray for those that are maybe making their way here this morning, that you would get them here safely. Those that are hearing from the live stream, we pray for them, encourage them at this time. And uh, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this moment, for this um, privilege, Lord, to come here together and to worship you and to hear from you this morning. We love you, Lord, and we pray all these things. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, a compromising um, church. So recently I heard a story about a guy who he couldn't decide what side he wanted to fight with when it came to the Civil War. So what he did is he wore the jacket for the North and he wore the trousers for the South. And then what ended up, ended up happening to him is he got shot from both sides. And um, that wasn't a very good outcome for him. And I think we can learn from this guy because when we start to live a life of compromise, we can live a life that becomes very miserable, a very miserable place to be. You see, when you have a foot in the world and you have a foot in the church, it begins to mess with you emotionally, mentally, and even physically. And um, just like this individual that got shot from both sides, there's really no winner in this case. And, and sadly, there are so many people in the church today that are living that life of, of compromise. And like I said, they have a foot in the world and they have a foot in the church. And when you're in that place, and I've been there before many times, and maybe everyone in this room, maybe if you're watching on the live stream, you've been in a world or in a place in your life where you're in the church, but there's also some compromise in your life. And you realize that that is a very difficult place to be living in. And this morning, what we're going to see here to the church of Pergamos or Pergamum is that there was a group of believers that were living in such a way. And unfortunately, what they were doing is they were leading many others astray because of their behavior. So just a little bit of a background here. Um, so far, what we've talked about is a church that left their first love, and that was the church of Ephesus. We talked about that 
uh, maybe it was a few weeks ago. And then we also talked about the Suffering Church, which was the church there in Smyrna. Well, today we're going to focus on Pergamos or Pergamum, which is this compromising church, and we'll learn more about that in just a little bit here. But just like the other letters, the Lord through John is going to address this church in a, in a specific way or a specific structure. So what we're going to see first is that the Lord's going to address this specific congregation or church. He's going to introduce himself um, as Jesus, as the Lord. And then he's going to give a statement regarding the condition of the church. There's going to be a verdict from him regarding that condition. And then there's going to be a command from him to the church. And then there's a general exhortation to all the Christians that are willing to hear. And then finally, at the end of the letter, what we're going to see is a promise that was given to this particular church as a reward. But before we do that, let me just talk a little bit about the city of, of Pergamum. So Pergamum actually means um, high tower. Okay, so high tower. And this church, this third letter that we're reading this morning um, there in, in Asia was actually located about 70 miles north of Smyrna. So that's the last letter that we read when um, we were together. And that's approximately the distance from El Paso, Texas, far west Texas, to Hatch, New Mexico. Okay, so it's about 70 miles north of Smyrna, which was that suffering church. Now, Pergamum can be noted as the center of culture and, and education. It was known as the greatest city there in Asia Minor. Um, and apparently, Pergamum had one of the great, greatest libraries there in the ancient world. And I think there was like over 200,000 um, volumes in that particular uh, library. So it was a very scholarly place, if you want to call it that. Um, and, and at this point of this writing, in this portion of scripture, Pergamum had been the capital of that particular region for about 300 years. Okay, a little over 300 years, actually, which is kind of a long time. But aside from the scholarly end of the, you know, the scholarly end of the spectrum, Pergamum was also known as kind of like a religious place. Um, it had temples that were devoted to the Greek and Roman gods, and there were several temples that were devoted to the worship of the emperor there, the Roman emperor. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the study. But Pergamum was also known as a place that had um, a specific place of worship for an individual called Asclepius. Asclepius, and if you remember, maybe you don't know this, but maybe you've heard about this, but Asclepius um, was represented by an entwined serpent on a staff, which is still a symbol that is used in the medical field nowadays. And this individual was known as the god of healing and knowledge. Okay, so that was located there in Pergamum. And there was actually a medical school and a temple that was devoted specifically to the worship of Asclepius. And it's said that many people from all over the Roman Empire would make their way uh, there to Pergamum uh, to worship this deity and to go into this place. And um, one scholar describes some of the healings that would take place there, supposed healings that would take place there in the following way. He says that those that were ill, they would spend the night in the darkness of the temple where the snakes were. And these were the tamed snakes, apparently. And if an ill person was touched by one of these snakes as they glided or slithered over them while they were on the floor, it's kind of creepy, um, apparently they were healed because it was like they were being touched by God himself. So obviously there was a lot of false doctrine, a lot of idolatry that was taking place there. And today what we're going to see through the word of God is that the Lord had several things against the church there in Pergamum. But there was also some wonderful things that were happening, happening there in that particular church. And I think, like I said, now I know that we will learn something here um, because the Lord always has something for us. So before we, we uh, actually look at this verse by verse, let me go ahead and read the entire text to you. It's pretty short here, about six verses. And then we'll look at it uh, verse by verse. So here in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, it says, Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death among you, where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites 
to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So repent, otherwise I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. Amen. All right, so the church of Pergamum. Now, if you look back at that very first verse, at the very first half of that verse in verse 12, what we see is that the Lord is addressing this particular church there in Pergamum, right? It says, write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. And we saw this with the other two churches that we've read about so far, right? He wrote to the angel of the church of Ephesus. He wrote to the angel of the church of um, Smyrna. And then, of course, today we're focusing on, on Pergamum. And as we discussed in the introduction, there was clearly some, some serious issues that were taking place in this particular city, this particular place where this church was located. And um, there were some issues spiritually that were taking place. But if you look in the second half of verse 12, notice that right away, the Lord introduces himself. Okay, this here we're speaking of, of, of Jesus. It says, thus says the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. And if you remember... At the beginning of the book of Revelation, John actually documents for us what he saw regarding the Lord. And he describes it in this way. He says in Revelation 1.16, He, the Lord, had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. So now the Lord is showing this two-edged sword uh, to the believers there in, um, in, in Pergamum. And of course, when you think of this double-edged or two-edged sword, you can think of the Word, the Word of God itself. And in fact, if you look in the book of Hebrews, there the author um, of the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4, if you look there in the 12th verse, it says, For the Word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And we also know from the Gospel of John, for example, that God is the Word, right? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. And then if you read a little bit later, in the 14th verse, the Word of God tells us there that the Word became flesh, and dwelt or tabernacled among us. Of course, they're speaking of Jesus, the Son of God. And then if you look in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, there regarding, regarding rather the word of God, right, this double-edged sword, it says there, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So he, the Lord himself, is that double-edged sword, right? The word of God here, right? The, the canon of scripture, there's nothing missing from here. He is the word, and this is exactly what he's talking about here. And we'll see a little bit later that the judgment of God begins with his own people, the church itself. And um, like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit later here, but this is exactly what he's speaking of. And when the Lord confronts us with his word, um, sometimes we can feel that sharp edge of the word of God, can't we? And God's word, we know, will never come forth void. It never does. And it sometimes hurts to hear God's word because it reveals things in our lives that need to be removed. And it's kind of like the refining of metal, right? There's dross in our lives that needs to be removed from the surface that way the Lord can continue to purify us. But sometimes we have to hear the hard truth. And, um, and sometimes people get offended, but the word of God's going to offend. Uh, it's not you, the messenger, that's offending, but rather it's the word of God. So whenever that happens, you don't want to take that personally. But certainly the Lord, in the Lord rather, we have been set apart from the world. And what we're going to see here is that the word of God, that double-edged sword, would separate the body of believers there from those that were compromising in Pergamum. 
And certainly the word of God reminds us and it refines us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, if you look in verse 13, um, the Lord now he shares with these individuals what he knows about them. And we know that the Lord knows everything. You know, sometimes we think we can hide from the Lord, even our thoughts, our motives, but the Lord knows everything. In verse 13, he tells them, he says, through John, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is, yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death among you, where Satan lives. Now, I don't know about you all, but when somebody says they know where you live, that's kind of a little frightening, you know? Uh, and God knew where they lived. He knew everything about them. And um, of course, when you think about the other churches that we've spoken of so far, those churches as well, the Lord knew their works and he had to correct some of them. And also, he also praised a couple of, of, of those churches as well. But when you think about us as individuals, this is also very true. As we live for the Lord, as we serve the Lord, um, our motives, our hearts behind all of those things, like the Lord sees all those things. Nothing's hidden from him. And um, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, you know, why are we doing what we are doing? And I think that's a very important question. And I want us to think about that just for a little bit. You know, what does the Lord know about me? And what does the Lord think about me? And why? Right? Do you ever ponder those questions? And I think... Um, you know, one of the things that Paul tells us, I think it's in the second letter to the Corinthians, is that we have to continuously evaluate ourselves, right? Like that should be a daily thing, um, you know, to kind of check ourselves. You know, sometimes we might think we're kind of in the right path, but maybe not necessarily we're not on that right path. And that's where the word of God comes into play. That double-edged sword, it refines us and it corrects us and it shapes us because the Lord sees everything. He knows everything. We have to make sure our hearts are in the right place. That way, everything else is in the right place, right? Because that's where, where everything begins. But notice here that the Lord knows. He knows the type of place that the, these individuals in Pergamum were living in. He refers to it as um, Satan's uh, throne, right? He knew that this was a place that had much satanic influence. And we kind of talked about this at the beginning because of all these temples and all these idols that were worshipped there. Now, when you think about the world we're living in today, certainly there is a stronghold here as well, or a great influence when it comes to Satan on this planet. When you think about it, you think about the, the laws that are being passed that are so ungodly, for example. You think about things that are wrong are considered right now. You think about a generation of defiant young people. You know, I think about the young people often. Um, you think about just all these things that we're facing as believers and um, sometimes we think, uh, you know, that the world is falling apart, but we have to remember that these are things that should, have, should be expected as the word of God tells us, right? Second Timothy 3 verses 1 through 5 tells us, but know this, hard times will come in the last days where people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. So certainly the times we're living in, guys, they are very uneasy. But remember that the Lord is still on the throne. Sometimes we forget that. The Lord is still in complete control. But the fact that we're going through these difficult times, um, socially and um, just, just in general in society um, can be a little uneasy. But going back to this church there in Pergamum, the beauty here is that despite the fact they were living in such an unholy place from the outside, right? Um, there was a group of believers there that were living in such a way that was very faithful to the Lord and very godly. And the Lord actually commends them, commends them for this. So once again, we can relate to this in the world that we're living in as individuals in the church, but also as a church as a whole. And, you know, this is, um, you know, everyone talks about this, right? We're not of this world, but we, we're in the world, right? And we have to uh, make sure that as we are continue on in these difficult times, that we continue holding fast to the Lord. And also, um, if it means persecution and death, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, there's an individual here 
that is named that actually went through that unfortunate um, circumstance. If you look at 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 17, there the Lord um, declares, Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear them or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and reverence, keeping a clear conscience, so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And certainly in these last days we're living in, this is exactly how we want to be living. Not fearing the persecution, not fearing the death, but having an answer to why it is we live the way that we live and be bold, being bold about it. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit here. But notice that the Lord mentions an individual in this, in this uh, particular verse named Antipas, right? And he actually addresses him as my faithful witness. He calls him his faithful witness. And um, what's interesting about this is if you look at the beginning there in the book of Revelation in the introduction, in chapter 1, verse 5, there's a very similar title that's given to Jesus himself. So in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, there John documents for us, it says, To the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So what we can conclude from this individual named Antipas is that he was a great follower of the Lord, and he was probably very, like, very much like the Lord in his walk. And it's interesting because we don't have this full story about this person named Antipas here this hero, you know, except what's kind of documented here. He's kind of like this mysterious guy, this mysterious person we don't have a lot of information about. But what is documented is pretty memorable for the Lord to want his name mentioned here um, in the book of Revelation, in this, in this specific portion of scripture. And what we can take away from this is that Antipas lived in this place where Satan's throne was. Yet he stood against the ways of the world around him, and he stood firm in the Lord. And what's interesting is the name Antipas actually means against all, against all. And this individual is known as the first individual from Asia Minor to die for refusing to worship the Roman emperor. Okay, and we'll talk more about that as we go along here. But in the times that we are living in these days, I think in particular, we need to be more like Antipas, right? Against all, against all the things that this world is presenting to us. And we have to understand that the world is perishing. So all these things that we have around us, just like Antipas had a lot of distractions around him that were evil and satanic, he was able to stand firm. And unfortunately, because of this, um, he ended up being killed. He was also a martyr. As the word of God tells us here, he was put to death. But the truth is, the beauty of this is that he died for his faith. He died for the Lord's sake. And I think that's more noble than sticking around and compromising and becoming more like the world, right? And we want to be more like Antipas. And what we can see here is that just like his brothers and his sisters in the Lord, they're in Smyrna. If you remember a while back when we talked about the church in Smyrna, that that was a church that was facing some, some difficulty as well, some suffering and some persecution. So we see this also happening here in, in Pergamum. But in the case of Antipas, once again, the beauty of this, what's so beautiful about this is that the Lord remembered him. The Lord remembered him, and, and I don't know, I, I want to be remembered by the Lord, don't you? And of course he remembers all of us, but I think in this way is, is just a beautiful way to be remembered. And this reminds me so much of Stephen. You guys remember Stephen, the guy that had a face like, like an angel? Not like angel, but like an angel. <laughs> remember, remember Stephen? Um, well, we talked about Stephen a while back in, um, in the youth group. So in our youth group, we, we were going through the book of Acts. So this was a while back. 
Um, but Stephen, if you remember, this was a guy who was filled with the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. This faithful individual, he's actually introduced to us in Acts chapter 6, if you look there in the book of Acts. But if you remember, Stephen was one of the seven men that was chosen um, to be responsible for the distribution of food to the widows because the, um, the apostles realized that they needed help at that time because there was so much that needed to be done. Um, but this guy, once again, he was filled with the Lord's grace and power. And if you look, I think it's in the seventh or eighth verse there in the sixth chapter, he started to perform miracles and wonders and just some great signs. But unfortunately, even in the midst of all of that, he began to build up some opposition. Some people began to rise, arise up against him, arise up against him. And the thing is, these individuals were no match for the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that was in him. Um, and what ended up happening is these individuals were beginning to falsely accuse Stephen of blasphemy or being a blasphemer, and they had him arrested. So they could only hurt him physically, but they couldn't really hurt him spiritually. And we know this from the word of God. Um, but if you remember there in the seventh chapter of Acts, there's a sermon or, you know, this presentation that he brings forth. We, call, we can call it a Stephen's sermon there. But it included a detailed record and history of Israel and their relationship with the Lord. So if you read chapter 7, um, it's this big sermon that he gives to, the, to these Jewish people. And it actually included their failure to recognize Jesus as their Messiah and the murdering of him as well. And the murdering of the prophets and all the faithful men that had come before them through the generations. And as expected, those accusations were not very well received by the Jewish people. And um, the beauty of this, though, and, you know, I remember talking to the young people about this, was Stephen's boldness. You know, he didn't regard his life, you know, he didn't value his life um, as much as he valued his boldness in the Lord and his uh, faithfulness to stand firm in the Lord and to say these things to these individuals. And what ended up happening is they rushed him, they dragged him out of the city, and they began to stone Stephen, right? Stephen was stoned. Um, you got to be careful when you say that to young people. But they killed him. They threw rocks at him and they killed him. And then in Acts chapter 7, in the very end, this is so noble and beautiful to me. In Acts chapter 7, verses 59 through 60, the word of God tells us, While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he fell asleep. And once again, this is just a wonderful and awesome example of faith. And, um, you know, we need to be more like Stephen. We need to be more like Antipas, as we read here in the church in Pergamum. In these last days, especially with all the compromise that's taking place, and all the compromise that we're seeing in the church, right? All this progressiveness, all this change, because we want to be more like the world and be favored by the world. We got to be careful. But I love this because we have these beautiful examples in scripture that we as individuals can follow and look up to. Now, as we move on into verse 14, um, and then we'll go ahead and read verse 15 as well. Uh, what we see next is the Lord actually addresses some of the issues that are taking place here in, um, in Pergamum. So if you look in verse 14, it says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites, to eat meat sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So clearly there was a problem here. And notice that despite the fact that there were so many believers there in Pergamum that were holding fast to the Lord, they were being faithful to the Lord in this difficult place. It did not excuse some of the few things that were happening there that were going against the Lord. You see, there was a group of compromising people that had infiltrated the church there um, in Pergamum. These uh, so-called Nicolaitans, and the Lord hated their doctrines. The Lord hated um, their practices. And if you remember, we actually talked about this a while back in the, in the, uh, the letter that he wrote to the Ephesians that very first letter, the church in Ephesus, right? The, the church that had left their first love. Uh, one thing he commended them on was the fact that they hated the deeds and the ways of the Nicolaitans just as he did. But here, unfortunately, these individuals had infiltrated the church and were contaminating the church and leading people astray. 
Now, the word, once again, Nicolaitans, means to conquer the people. And these were false teachers, of course, false doctrines, idolatry, unholy things. One scholar describes their practices in this way, and I quote here, like all deceivers that come from the body of Christ, claim not that they were destroying Christianity, but that they were presenting an improved and modernized version of it. So this sounds very similar to some of the things we hear today in our world and in our society, right? People want to modernize Christianity, um, but in the process, they change the word of God. And we got to be careful with that. There's different ways you can present the word of God, but you don't change the word of God. You just present it in different ways. We can talk more about that later. But progressive Christianity is a good example of, of this particular explanation. Now, another scholar suggested that the Nicolaitans reasoned that the human body was evil anyways, so only the spirit was good, and therefore one could do whatever they wanted to with their bodies because it had no importance. And the spirit, on the other hand, was the recipient of grace, meaning that that grace and forgiveness was theirs regardless of what they did with their body. Um, obviously, false doctrines, that's not, a, that's not the way to be living, right? There should be a change in our lives when the Lord comes into our lives, and we know this through the word of God. Now, in addition to this, the Nicolaitans, they practiced and they were teaching um, the teachings of Balaam. And when you think about Balaam, think back, for example, to the book of Numbers, okay, in the Old Testament. If you look there, for example, if you, if you start reading like in the 21st chapter, you read all the way to like chapter 31, it tells you there that Balaam combined the sins of immorality and idolatry to please Balak, who was the king of Moab. And since he did this because he couldn't curse Israel directly. Now, remember Balaam, he counseled Balak, right? And he taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols and to perform sexual immorality or to commit sexual immorality, if you remember. Um, and unfortunately, many of the Jews fell into that trap and they did those very things. And if you read in Numbers 25, it tells us because of that disobedience and because of that um, compromise, 25,000 people died. you got to be careful. Now, this is a very important piece of history for the believers there in Pergamum, but I also believe for us because of the times that we're living in too. Compromise has consequences, right? Because compromise leads to sin and the wages of sin is death. And there's always going to be consequences to our actions. And we were talking about this on Wednesday, our, our, our actions, our sin, the consequences have a ripple effect, right? There's a non-local impact. Everybody around you is impacted in some capacity because of what we do, and that's what compromise does. Um, but if you think about the Nicolaitans, this was a group of people that was causing others to compromise, other people to stumble and to, um, and to follow those, uh, those unholy ways. And in fact, one of the things is they were causing people to compromise and become a friend of Rome. Okay, that's what they were really doing. And it really, it really wasn't a big deal to them because after all, all they were doing was introducing um, an improved version of Christianity. They weren't necessarily changing it in their minds. And when they would do this, when individuals would compromise, it protected them from Roman persecution, um, but it cost them their testimony. And that's something we need to learn because when we compromise, it costs us our testimony, right? Like it takes a long time to build your character and your credibility. And then in a moment, you can lose all of that. And we gotta be very careful with that. Antipas, however, was a great example of an individual in that time that did not compromise. Okay, we talked about this in ju uh, just a while ago. He became a martyr for the faith. He was memorable to the Lord. And unfortunately, nowadays, so many people are willing to turn to compromise and even in the church, right? We've talked about progressive Christianity. We've talked about compromise that's come into the church. And the reason why this is happening is because for some reason we want to gain favor with the world. We want to be liked by the world. But the truth of the matter is we cannot conform the teachings of the word of God to the world, but rather the world has to change and transform to the teachings of the word of God. That's what needs to happen. And we as believers of the church we need to stand firm. We cannot be weak in these times, right? We can't just like fall over. We have to be firm. We have to be willing to die for the faith, just like Antipas, just like Stephen, right? 
We want to be able to, to do those things. And the only way we can do that is by being in the word and being in, in a fellowship with the Lord. Now, when you think about the ancient Roman Empire, the worship of idols and sexual immorality was very common. It was, it was a very common thing. It was, um, it was not um, out of the ordinary. And when you think about the society we live in right now, idolatry and sexual immorality is, is all over the place. It's awful. Um, I mean, it's nothing new under the sun, but these are things that we're struggling with as, um, as believers in this world and as a society as a whole. Um, and as many of you know, I, um, I work in a public high school. So one of the things that I see daily is that the wickedness of this world has infiltrated the minds and the hearts of so many of our young people through social media, through, um, through friends, through family, through mainstream society. And a lot of the young people are confused. They have this wrong mindset when it comes to sexual relationships, to relationships in general. They're experimenting sexually. They're having sex. They're young people. They're not even married yet. And we know that sexual immorality is anything that occurs outside of the marriage. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit here. But it really grieves me to see this happening amongst our young people. And that's why we need to fight for our young people through prayer, through intercession. And um, I'm not a parent. I don't have any kids. But I truly believe that there's too many parents in the world right now that are too busy being their kids' friends and not necessarily being their kids' parents. And we need to be, as, as parents, I'm not a parent, but it, I, I believe parents need to step, up, step it up a little bit and, and show these young people the ways of the Lord and pray to the Lord fervently that they don't depart from them. Because what the world is showing our young people is irresponsible, it's satanic, it's, um, it's an awful thing, it's ungodly, it's unholy. And, and, it, and these young people are leading other young people to go astray. So it's just this, this um, multiplicative effect, if you will. And it's just not a good thing. We need, we need to pray for our young people. But don't lose heart. It may seem like the world's falling apart, but really it's falling into place. So as, even as bad as things are getting, um, we have to stay focused on the Lord because um, that's what we look to. He's the one we look to. Um, but really our young people, it really, it's, it grieves me. I have a soft spot in my heart for our youth, our young people, and um, let's just continue to pray for them and fight for them, that they see the ways of the Lord and they, um, they transform and they conform to those ways. Now, when you think about sexual immorality, we know from the Word of God, once again, that any type of sexual activity that's outside of marriage, and remember, marriage is a matrimony between one man and one woman, right? Matrimony between one man and one woman any type of sexual activity outside of the marriage is considered sexual immorality. And remember what the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, here regarding sexual immorality. He says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Um, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you are bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. So we need to flee sexual immorality because when we do those things, we're sinning against our body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit lives. And we were actually talking a little bit about this on Wednesday in our men's study there in the 39th chapter um, of Genesis. And if you remember there in that 39th chapter, um, there we have Potiphar, right? Remember Potiphar, he had purchased Joseph from the Ishmaelites uh, for 20 shekels of silver. And um, if you remember in that 39th chapter, Potiphar's wife had made several sexual advances um, to Joseph, which he resisted. Um, and finally, that, final, that last advance that she made to him, he fled. He ran away. He fled sexual immorality by running away from that circumstance, that temptation, and, um, and that immoral thing that this woman wanted to commit with him. You see, Joseph loved and he valued his relationship and his heart and his love for the Lord more than this short-lived pleasure. And I think for us, that's something we can learn from because that's something we need to do as well. And I know that the world we're living in, the world that the people there in Pergamum were living in in that time, that's easier said than done. But the truth of the matter is we have everything we need 
um, to walk in the victory that the Lord has given to us. And when we commit sexual immorality, once again, it's commit, committing that against the body, right? Every other sin's outside the body, but this one's against the body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we know from the word of God that the Holy Spirit's a person and we can grieve the Holy Spirit and we can quench the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit fills and sees and, and you know, every emotion we have, the Holy Spirit is, is going through that with us as he lives in us. And we want to make sure we don't quench or grieve the Holy Spirit. And once again, just like believers in that time, it was a very difficult thing to go against the current or the flow of sexual immorality. But certainly, like I said before, we have everything we need to, to walk in the victory that we have in the Lord. And we can flee from those things. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13 tells us, No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. So praise God. He's able to help us in those difficult times of temptation and difficulty. We also have each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. In those difficult times, we can reach out to each other and help each other, encourage each other uh, during those times of temptation and difficulty. Now, when you think about this church here in Pergamum, um, it was very reminiscent of the church in Corinth as far as sexual immorality taking place in the church and being tolerated. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in that first verse, there Paul, he writes, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Even though I am absent in the body, I am present in the spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as indeed you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or a sister and is sexually immoral or greedy and idolater or verbally abusive or a drunkard or a swindler. So this is very heavy. Similar to the church there in Pergamum, here we see or we, we read um, a very similar circumstance there in the church in Corinth. And as the church, our sole um, goal is for restoration, right? We want to restore people. Um, however, if someone refused to be restored, that's when you do need to remove them from the church. And the issue that Paul was having here is that they were tolerating this sexual immorality that was taking place in the church. And once again, an example of compromise here, allowing this to take place. If you have a new believer in the faith seeing this happen, they're going to think it's okay to be doing that. And then they're going to they're gonna, um, partake in that type of activity. We need to be very careful. So what we see here, once again, is an example of compromise, just like we saw with, um, with Pergamum, and even in the church today. We need to follow the commands of the Lord. We need to love the Lord more than the environment that we're living in. And sometimes that can be a little bit difficult, but um, we have everything we need to walk in that victory. Um, we can't just give up, guys. We can't just be like, well, this is just the way it is now. Um, no, we, we need to fight for what's true and for what's right. Um, and we know what that is through the word of God. You see, the Lord never intended us to meet him in salvation and then be strangers until we stand before him in glory. Like, that's not how it works. We need to be in communication. We need to be in communion with the Lord um, until we see him face to face. Now, if you look in verse 16, now the Lord commands the church in Pergamum what it is they need to do. Okay, um, it may seem pretty simple, but sometimes this is a very hard thing to do. He tells them in verse 16, so repent, 
Otherwise, I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So it was very clear that Antipas had felt the sword of Rome, right? He refused to worship the Roman Empire, um, um, emperor rather. But the church here at Pergamum would feel the sword of the Lord, that is his word. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a little bit. We'll talk about um, what that means. Um, but the, he would do this only if they did not repent. You see, these individuals already knew the truth. So they could not be ignorant about it any longer. They had no excuse. They needed to act. And I think the same could be said for us as a church today. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 27, and this is kind of heavy, it says, For if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. We have no excuse. We know the truth already, right? And, and sometimes people say, well, maybe it's better that you didn't know the truth because of the way you're living. And we need to be careful with that. Um, and here, once again, they needed to repent when you think about it. I know a lot of times we make excuses. I've done it, right? When we were in the midst of sin and we still do something wrong, we try to justify it. And if you have an excuse for doing it, it's probably a really bad excuse. So we need to be very careful about that. Now, when you think about repentance, repentance is hard, right? Because that means you got to change something. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't like change. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. You know, can we just do things the way we used to be doing it? Um, but when it comes to sin, we need to repent. And the sooner we repent, the easier it is to kind of get away from that sin. Because the more you do it, the more habitual it becomes. And it's going to be harder to get rid of it. Now, um, now, I won't go away completely, right? That, that temptation will always be there, but you want to get away from giving in to that temptation is, is what I'm getting at. Now, when you think about rep repentance, there are three elements that need to take place, okay? Number one, you need to ask the Lord to forgive you first and foremost, right? And we've talked about this before. First John 1, 9, people like to call that the Christian bar of soap. Um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God is so good because he will always, he will always forgive us of our sins as we come to his throne of grace boldly, wholeheartedly, and ask him to forgive us. Um, and God is so good. He will always be there for us, receive us with open arms. Secondly, we need to have a broken and a contrite heart. So in other words, we need to be truly sorry for our sin, not because we got caught, but because we're really sorry that we sinned against the Lord. And um, if you look, for example, in Psalm chapter 51, and everyone knows this psalm, right? Remember there, um, Nathan had confronted King David because of his, um, his adulterous act with Bathsheba and then killing her husband Uriah, and it grieved him deeply. And here in Psalm 51, verses 16 through 17, here we see his heart. He says, you, speaking to the Lord, um, you do not want a sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humble heart, God. And certainly the Lord will never turn away from us if our heart is broken and humble before him. Now, if we're confessing our sin and we really don't mean it, then the Lord's not going to receive that. He sees our heart. He sees all of that. We've got to make sure that our heart is truly broken and contrite and sorry for what we did. The last thing we need to see is with repentance is that there should be a change in your life, right? And that's the hard thing. And when you think about repentance, um, it's, it's a complete 180 degree turn from the original direction that you're going. You can think of it like this. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11. Here Paul is speaking of, of such things to the church there in Corinth. He says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived, no sexual, sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, and some of us used to be like this, right? But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And then furthermore, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. 
How can we, how can we who died to sin still live in it? So these three elements um, should be present in our lives when we repent of sin in our lives. And um, this, is, this can be a very difficult thing, but we're able to do it because the Lord has given us everything that we need. In particular, the power and the person of the Holy Spirit to help us work through this process. Um, now, we're not going to be sinless on this side of heaven. We've talked about this before, but we should have that heart to desire to sin less on this side of heaven. We're not going to be perfect until we see the Lord face to face. But notice here that if they don't do these things, the Lord tells them, I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So in other words, if the believers here in Pergamum um, didn't repent, those that were going against the Lord, they would face the Lord with his two-edged sword and be confronted with his word. And in fact, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it says there, For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? So this tells us here that judgment would come um, to God's house first. And in particular here, the Lord would judge these individuals that were not repenting and turning to the Lord and continuing to live in these ways of the Nicolaitans and um, the ways of, um, of, of Balaam, or the practices of Balaam, rather. So repentance was the only way out. And that was true for them then. And this is actually true for us now as well. Now, if you look in the first half of 17, um, actually in verse 17, we'll read this together. Um, what we see here is that there's a reward for that repentance. There's a reward for that change in the lives of these individuals. So in verse 17, the first half, um, here's, here's this general exhortation, which we've seen in all the other letters. It says, let anyone who has ears to hear, uh, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So it's very critical here that the Lord, um, you know, what the Lord is saying here, and just like the other letters, if you're willing to hear, it's a good thing, right? Um, and as believers, we better listen when the Lord's, you know, talking to us through his word or through a sermon or whatever. We need to listen to the Lord. And when you think about the false teaching and all, and all the immoral behavior that was taking place here in Pergamum, and this is particular society, these are things that the church now is also very much in danger of, and we're seeing it happen in the church. And we need to be aware of all this and be bold and go against it, um, just as we saw with um, these other individuals. But then notice in verse 17, the second half, part B, here we see this promise of a reward. It says, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. So those that overcame the false teaching and living will receive hidden manna is what it says here. And if you remember, when God fed the Israelites in the wilderness, he fed them manna, right? And um, when you think about this, instead of eating the things that were being sacrificed to idols, what they needed to be doing here is they needed to be feasting on God's holy food. Okay, when I think about God's holy food, I think about the word of God, for example. Jesus tells us in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty. And Jesus himself is the bread of life. Jesus, who is also God, is the word. And that's what we need to be feasting on daily. Don't literally eat your Bible, but read your Bible, right? You know, I remember when I was, um, I guess you guys remember this too. Maybe when you're in school, somebody, you, you didn't study for a test. You're like, well, sleep, sleep on, under the book or, or put the book under your pillow or eat the book. You'll remember everything, right? Not this case. Read it, apply it, and let it become flesh in your life, right? Now, the white stone that is mentioned here, in those times, this white stone could mean a number of things. It could mean a sign of friendship. It could mean a sign of forgiveness. It could mean a ticket to a special event. But what we know for sure is that this was some sort of assurance for a blessing, okay? And on this stone, it says that there would be a new name on it, and only the person that received it would know that name, um, and most likely the believer's new name would be inscribed on this stone is what is suggested by many of the scholars who, um, who study these particular scriptures here. But that name was more valuable than the stone probably. And when you think about it, you can think of this perhaps almost as a ticket home to the kingdom of God or to heaven. And we know as believers at this place, it's not our home. 
Our citizenship is in heaven, right? Philippians 3.20 tells us, Paul tells us there, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're simply pilgrims in this desolate world or desolate wasteland, if you want to call it that. Um, But what a beautiful promise and reward for repentance and for faithfulness in the Lord as he's commanded these people here in Pergamum, particularly to those that were um, living in ways that were not honoring the Lord. So in closing this morning, there was a lot of stuff in this, in this, um, in these very few verses that we read this morning. And as we close this morning, hopefully we can reflect on those things. But what we need to understand is that even when we're walking with the Lord, it doesn't mean that we are immune to compromise. Compromise is going to be the, the arrows of compromise are going to be hitting us all the time until we finally leave this planet and we see the Lord um, face to face. Now, when it comes to compromise, it's a terrible way to live because you're living in two worlds. Literally, you are living in two worlds. You're living in the church and living in the world. You have to hide that. It, it messes with you emotionally and physically. It's just not a very good place to be, but it's certainly an easy trap to fall into. And all of us as believers perhaps have fallen into that trap. I know I have. And when you live like that, you're miserable. You're not, you're, not, um, you're not in sync with the Lord. It's just not a good way to live. You see, we can't have a foot in the church and a foot in the world because you're either a saint or you're an ain't, right? Or you're either a believer or you're a make-believer. You can't have it both ways. You're either in or you're out. And it's hard. I know it's hard to live in the world we're living in, just like these individuals in Pergamum. Galatians 5.17 tells us, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And that's our struggle. It's the spirit and it's the flesh. And we have to feed the spirit more than we feed the flesh, right? And that's where the word of God comes in, that double-edged sword. So three things I want us to remember as we go about our week um, from everything that we learned this morning. Number one, compromise comes when we leave our first love. Okay, and we kind of learned this a little bit from the church in Ephesus that we read about a while back. When we're not living in fellowship with the Lord, um, we're going to be on the road to destruction. Okay, we need to understand that when you give the enemy a little bit of space in your life, he's going to take a lot of space in your life. And we want to make sure that every crevice in our life, if you want to call it that, is occupied by the Lord, the Holy Spirit, his word. Easier said than done, but that should be our goal as believers in this day and age especially in these times that we're living in where compromise is all over the place and has made its way into the church. And I think sometimes when we do compromise, we can think like a little bit of this, a little bit, a little bit of that, like it's okay and we justify it. But when we let those little bits come into our lives, eventually we start to compromise in bigger and bigger ways. And then we can end up in a really bad place. James 4, 17 tells us, so it is sin to know the good and yet not do it, right? And that's what compromise makes us do. John 14, 15 tells us, this is the Lord, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And we, just like we saw with Stephen, we talked about Stephen, and we saw with Antipas from this particular portion of scripture, we need to love the Lord more than our own desires and the world and sin around us. The second thing we want to take away from this is we cannot let compromise infiltrate the church. Now, the church is not going to be perfect. You know what messes up the church? It's people. It's us. So when you find the perfect church, you're going to mess it up. So you should probably leave. Um, But yeah, we mess up the church because we're people. We're not going to be perfect on this side of heaven. Romans, the book of Romans tells us that every single day we're going to fall short of God's glory. But um, as believers, we need to fight for the faith and we can't let compromise come into the church. Just like we saw with the Corinthians, Paul told them, you know, get rid of this person that you're tolerating, you know. And of course, the, 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 the purpose of church is not to kick people out of church. It's to restore people, right? Restoration is the key. We've been restored, right? People were patient with us. That's what we want. But if somebody refuses to change, you need to remove them because you need to protect the flock. And we as believers need to be on the lookout for that. That way people don't go astray. And it's so easy these days to go with the flow of the world, right? And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. As believers, we need to be living like salmon. Have you guys seen salmon swim upstream to spawn and um 
I don't know if you've seen this in person or maybe like you've seen it on National Geographic or like Nova and there's like always like a, a British guy with a phony accent. He's narrating. He's like, the salmon's going upstream. And then like the salmon's flowing, like swimming upstream and it's really dramatic. Like there's this waterfall. We got to live like that. Even if we're drowning in the world, we got to go upstream, go against the flow, just like these salmon, um, especially in this time we're living in. It's, there's so much compromise and so much um, wickedness around us. We don't ever want to become progressive. There's progressive churches around us now, and we don't ever want to fit in the world. We need to understand that love is not tolerance, but rather true love comes with correction and rebuke. Proverbs 3.12 tells us that the Lord corrects those or he disciplines those who he loves. We can't change the word of God to conform to the world, but rather we have to change, the world rather has to change to transform to the word of God. Amen. That's what we need to do. Now, in the midst of compromise, we also need to be willing to die and stand for the truth with boldness. We saw this with Antipas, and then we talked about the, the brothers and the sisters in the church there in Smyrna. We talked a little bit about Stephen. Ephesians 6, 14, Paul tells us, stand your guard, putting on the belt of truth and the, and the body armor of God's righteousness. And that's what we need to do every single day. And then lastly, the third thing, out of our obedience, we will be rewarded for our faithfulness and overcoming the world around us. And we talked about this with the other churches as well. And God was so good because even when we mess up, like so many here in Pergamum we're doing, he will always forgive us and he will always receive us with open arms because he loves us so much. You see, God's love is radical. I still don't understand how he loves me. I don't understand. I'm not the person that should be loved, but he loves me. He loves all of us. We, we can't explain it. And he'll do that for everybody. His grace, though, is only possible through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can receive this love. And you see, the Lord did it freely for everybody. He doesn't resent us for going to the cross, but rather he sees us and he says to himself that we were worth it. Now, Pastor Chuck once said, grace transforms desolate and bleak plains into rich green pastures. It changes grit your teeth duty into loving, enthusiastic service. It exchanges the tears and guilt of our own failed efforts for the eternal thrill and laughter of freely offered pleasure at the right hand of God. Grace changes everything. And certainly God's grace has changed us. It's transformed us and it renews us every single day. And then one final reminder from the Lord himself through the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 12 verse 2, he, he says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good pleasing, and perfect will of God. Amen? That's how we should be living in these days. So this morning, um, once again, I don't know if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're watching via the live stream, or maybe even here um, in person, but certainly we want to give you that opportunity. And maybe you're living that, I don't know, double life right now. Maybe you're living with a foot in the world, and maybe you're kind of trying to step into the church and you're living a life that is just awful right now. It's, it's unsatisfying. It's draining you physically and mentally. We want to give you the opportunity to invite a loving father into your life who's going to love you. He's going to forgive you of your past, your current, and your future sins. And he's going to do it um, in a very loving way. He'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. We want to give you that opportunity this morning. So if that's you this morning, I want to invite you to repeat this prayer after me. But you have to say this with all your heart. You can't just say this with the surface or lip service. You have to mean this wholeheartedly. And if that's you this morning, just repeat this prayer um, with me. My Heavenly Father, this morning, I just want to thank you so much, Lord God, for your son, Jesus. Lord, this morning, I want to invite Jesus into my life to be my Lord and Savior. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that Jesus was buried I believe that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. Lord, I'm a sinner and I pray that you ask, I'm sorry, I pray and I ask that you forgive me of my sins and that you please fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Transform me, change me, shape me, and please use me for your glory. I pray these things, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to thank you so much for welcoming the Lord into your life. We want to welcome you to the, to the family of Christ. And um, the Word of God tells us that even when one sinner repents, there's a celebration going on in heaven. And um, I assure you, there's a celebration going on on your behalf. 
And if you want more information about your next steps, maybe you need a Bible, maybe you need prayer, um, you need fellowship, you need people to talk to, whatever you need, uh, please let us know. Reach out to the church. You can come visit us. We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m., uh, 4242 Hondo Pass, um, uh, right on the intersection of Gateway South and, and Hondo Pass. And um, we can, uh, we can uh, we're here for you. Whatever you need, just let us know. And um, if you come across this a little bit later, maybe it's not the live stream. We want to thank you um, for taking the time to watch this video. And uh, we hope that the Lord blessed you. So once again, thank you so much for taking the time this morning. We're praying for you. Um, we love you and we're here for you. Okay. Have a blessed day and we'll see you again soon.